In case you haven't seen our video on the mask mother, good. At this point I'm considering taking the video down. When I made that video, I had fun speculating about these creatures based on the descriptions which we got off of Twitter. But later, when we got the in-game voice lines, it became obvious I was wrong. And quite frankly, I'm... I'm embarrassed, alright? Every time someone mentions Avastaya, I have the urge to hide in a corner. And to help out with my embarrassment. Two days ago, Riot released another Kindred story, which gave us even more information on these beings. So yeah, I'll probably take down the old video and I'll deny it ever happened. But if people want, I will fight my shame and I will remake it. Either way, today we are diving into the latest story called Finishing Sotes. And just like all the other stories mentioning death, be ready for an open-ended world building which brings up more questions than answers. Before we start, about halfway through the story, we learn that all of this happened while Jarvan II was still alive, and Jarvan III was just a young boy. So this story happened in the past. I just thought I would mention it now to make everything easier to understand. The story begins in a theater called The Mummer's Round, in Alderberg in the region of Nockmerch, where actors were rehearsing moments before they were going to play. Our main character, Tarnold, who was the dramatist of the theater, knew this performance was doomed the moment he realized how unprofessional his actors were. There was Artlo, who played a character known only as the Philosopher. This character wouldn't stop dying, which, after a while, made his constant pretending to die absurd. Last time he made his death groan, the second actor, Nanny, laughed so hard, her lamb's mask fell from her face and cracked. The third actor, Emil, removed his wolf's mask. He winced in pain, because the mask's edges were so sharp, they started cutting into his jaw. At this point, Tarnold shouted at the actors to stop. The theater was built on top of the Lord Castellan's hillfort, and looking outside, Tarnold saw the drunk nobles descending down from the Castellan's home to watch the mummer's theatrics. They were out of time. But worse, Tarnold knew a displeased crowd of drunken nobles was worse than the humiliation of a failed play. As a fun detail, the title of Lord Castellan was first properly used in the Garen novel, where, coincidentally, we were talking about Lord Castellan of Nockmerge. So this may be happening in the same place where the Garen novel happened. Anyway, let's continue. The actors released their pose and turned to face Tarnold, who was rubbing the bridge of his nose. Tarnold then shouted at his assistant, Dorte, to go outside and buy them as much time as he can. Dorte nodded and he told him that he will hold the audience until he hears his sign. Tarnold added to hold them even if Lady Urhin demands a preview. They were on the verge, they would fall together, or rise together. Dorte replied, rise we shall, and he added the theater's motto, with the gust of life. Then Dorte kissed his own palm and placed it on the story stones, after which he left. The story stones were the foundation of the Mummer's Round, it was a series of towering rocks that formed a circle. These stones stood here long before anyone settled in Nockmerge. Over the years, wooden viewing platforms were raised to allow a better view of the theatrics and the rituals performed here. The performers and singers notched the pillars with their sigils, leaving their mark upon hallowed ground. With Dorte outside, holding the audience, and the sun slowly dipping closer to evening, Tarnold unleashed his temper to try and make things right. First, he talked to Artlo. Ask a great city boy for water and a great city boy will bring you fire. There is to be one death and one death alone, Artlo. Then he turned to Nanny. Stop laughing at Artlo's nincompoopery, you daughter of Skagorn. Shake off your provincial humors and exude the cold menace of death. Editor's note, the Skagorn are a Freljordian tribe that moved to the southern lands. They are rivaling Nockmerch. Finally, Tarnold pointed to Emil. I can see your blood dribbling down your cheek. Dab your cheeks. Emil asked if he could fix some padding to the inside of the wolf mask, but Tarnold told him to project through the pain instead. This is where the story revealed that these actors were trying to play a story written by Sotes. Simply said, Sotes is the Shakespeare of Runeterra. She is a legendary scribe and a bard who wrote the kindred fables. On her deathbed, she started writing a play called Lambs in the Orchard. But Sotes died before she could finish this final gush of madness. 
So now, Tarnold and the crew were trying to play and finish this incomplete masterpiece. Hence the name of the story. That's why Tarnold was so frustrated. He even pointed out that the actors were wearing Sotace's heirlooms. Nanny interrupted him by pointing out that her mask didn't fit her. But Tarnold was done. So he told her to use straps. And he even pulled off his own belt and threw it at Nanny's feet to make it faster. Tarnold realized the endless hours of rehearsals had done nothing to prepare them for the performance. And partially he accepted it as his own fault. As the chief dramatist of Alderberg's greatest and only theater, he had the grim task of finishing the story. This is when Tarnold gave a speech explaining the situation. Lamps in the Orchard was Sotes' final gush of madness. The very last of her spark is here, in our hands. And you all choose to desecrate her memory, picking at it for your own vanity and comfort. She spent her final moments coaxing truths from the impending Nevermore. Had death not stilled her hand while writing this very scene, perhaps you would all have a far greater understanding of our own brief and tragic existence. There was a moment of silence, before Artlow pointed out that maybe an unfinished work was not meant to be finished. Maybe they should just stop the performance where it ends. After all, they couldn't replicate the emotions of a master writing against time. Tarnold lashed back at him. If anything, looking at the dwindling rays of sunlight outside, they were out of time. But still, Artlow was right. They were never able to recreate the spark found in her other fables either. It was Lady Urhin, a Sotasis devotee and the patron of this theater, who asked Tarnold to do the impossible and give the work an ending. In desperation, Tarnold even sent Dorte to the great city in the west, which they called the great city of Jarvan II, to hunt down the original kindred masks. They were ancient and therefore expensive. Tarnold's head slumped and his shoulders followed. Then he was on his back, struggling to breathe. His heart raced against the quickening hour. They had to cancel the performance. Worse, they would be forced to offer refunds. But they already spent the gold. Nanny said that this probably wasn't a good time to mention that the lamp mask was broken. Tarnold's face suddenly drained of color. Nanny held one of the wooden ears in her hands. And she said it was an accident. It broke off when it fell from her face, but she was hoping she could strap it back together. Tarnold almost laughed at how utterly majestic the situation was. Those masks were exactly what they spent the gold on. They were on loan. But he wasn't done trying just yet. He stood up to look around and think. This theater had been his home during many difficult times. And now, under his stewardship, it was the source of all his sorrow. Then, a mysterious voice of a woman spoke from the middle balcony, reserved for the wealthiest of nobles. A broken mask tells two stories. Three if you consider the tale of the mask maker. Alas, no one wishes to hear that story. Darnold was confused. They all agreed for no visitors during rehearsals. But up until now, everyone thought she was with Darnold. Darnold himself wasn't sure about this because he battled insomnia for weeks, so everything was possible. Still, he asked her, who was she? The woman stepped forward, but the light of the stage illuminated little of her mysterious figure. Her eyes were distant stars shining through mist. She wore a ghostly half-mask with a curious twirl of a twig sprouting of the top. Upon that sprig was a single dark leaf. Her elegant walk sang of nobility, and Tarnold finally recognized the crest on her dress. This was their patron, recovered from her illness, Lady Erhin. Once Tarnold realized that, he bowed down, and he asked her what was the mask she wore on her face. It was familiar, yet beyond memory. And so Lady Erhin explained. It was made of Eldlock. The stories tell that any wood removed from an Eldlock will continue to blossom and flower in seasons with its mother tree as long as it still stands. No distance would sever their bond. Of course, based on this description, some of you may have realized that Lady Erhin is wearing the mask of the Mask Mother. Lady Erhin then proposed a solution to making their performance work. For a moment, Tarnold fidgeted with his hands. Then he agreed that advice from their patron was always welcome. And so she proposed that since back in the day when Sotes was still alive, 
all actors wore a mask. Maybe now they all also had to wear a mask to channel the strange spirits she saw at death's door, as she scribed furiously into the knight's embrace. Artlow liked that idea, and he immediately rushed to the backstage to find their trunk full of masks. Tarnold tried to stop him, but he was silenced by the sight of the gaunt lady with the Eldlock mask. Clasping her hands together, there was something off about their benefactor. Before Tarnold could put his finger on it, Artlow returned with the trunk. The name QW Sotes was engraved on its side, and only now did Tarnold realize how much it resembled a coffin. Artlow opened it, and the lady told them that before they choose their masks, they should pay attention to what she has to say. The hour is late and the show waits to play, and tonight can be truly memorable if all choose the mask that is right for them. For the spirits we become, inhabit us, Emil completed. The mummer's tenet, Nanny said. Whatever flavor of madness this is, Artlow said, a grin spreading on his face. I want to be a part of it. Come, Tarnold. Even you must agree that at this late stage, we must perform with the gust of life. Tarnold was still a bit confused by the lady's presence. He thought the balcony was empty when Dorte left. The whole theater was empty. Lady Erhin struck him as different now too. She seemed gaunt and haunted. Perhaps the noble Lady Erhin hadn't entirely shaken off her affliction. The evening chill was settling in, so Tarnold offered her a cloak. But Lady Erhin waved off his offer. Instead, her attention went to the mask Artlow chose to wear. He chose one resembling the Vulture. The lady explained, the vulture picks at what remains, and when nothing is left, it flies on to perches far removed from here, and waits for the next meal. Artlow agreed that pecking at Sotes' legacy sounded like a feast. Lady Erhin then approached the stage, and she let the light illuminate her. Suddenly, her skin didn't look like a flesh. It reminded Arnold of plaster, after it had been set and smoothed. Her hair was the very night itself, radiating outward in a wavering embrace. It was then that Tarnold realized he mistook her for someone else. And so he exclaimed, this wasn't Lady Erhin. But the other actor seemingly ignored Tarnold's revelation. Now, a chilling swoon descended upon his heart. Its beating pulsed loudly in his ears, nearly drowning out the actor's words. Nanny and Emil agreed to switch their masks of the lamp and the wolf, and as they put them on, the walls whispered as a gust of wind swept through the murmurs round. Shudders clacked shut. Tarnold heard voices in that swift and swirling breeze. Heartbeats, lamp. Here, a deep voice growled. Tarnold looked for its source, but he could only see the actors, who all seemingly forgot about him. Then, in his left ear sang another voice. Bits of light, dancing in the dark, playing on, playing on, playing on. On the stage, he saw Nanny and Emil hand in hand, wearing each other's masks. Then he saw the otherworldly words were coming from the actor's mouths. Yes, Emil said, shifting his voice up to a lilting and haunted falsetto. I see my darling as wolf now. Ah, Nanny let out a relieved growl, her voice guttural and deep. That feels better, little lamb. The actor dropped down on all fours and stretched lower than a human should be able to. Is it time to play chase? When the veil lifts, you shall claw and bite, my arrow swift, and on to the next act we go. Tarnold walked across the stage, fixated on the lady. He demanded to know what trickery was this. The lady turned, and she simply confirmed that she wasn't his patron. Arnold then shouted at the actors to go off the stage and go home. He even shouted at Dorte who was still outside. But yet again, he was silenced by the woman's gaze. Still, he fought against it. He told the actors to take off the masks. This play was cursed. What if Sotes did not happen to die while writing it? Tarnold thought that the act of writing lamps in the orchard was itself what killed her. The narrative itself was a curse. It was not the gaunt lady, Nanny's wolf or Emil's lamp that replied. Artlow, or whatever spoke through Artlow, answered in a screeching voice. He spread his arms high and stood up on one leg like a carrion bird. 
The author awaits my beak. He said, the corners of his lips cracked and split open. Sotes is truly dead, as none remember her now as she once was. Tarnold noticed tears ran down Artlow's stretched cheeks, which meant that even as the spirits spoke through them, the actors were conscious and in pain as their bodies moved against their will. Artlow then continued, Sotes flies in my wake, soon lost and forgotten. Words on a page, a name on the wind, shreds, nothing more. Shreds of Sotes is still Sotes, the lady said. He sees the performance, and he wears no mask, the vulture replied, pointing at Tarnold. The woman then told Tarnold that he was so close to Sotes, once he would choose a mask, he would see her final scene come alive. At that moment, Tarnold thought about running away into the Castellan's fort or into the town. He wondered what would he find in Lady Erhin's house. But then, he remembered how many nights he dreamt of Sotes' final moments and of the final scene. Everyone must wear a mask, the woman said. As an interesting fact, I believe the woman said everyone must wear a mask because she is referring to the fact that everyone must die. Mouth agape. Arnold nodded in agreement with the woman in the Eldlock mask, that dark leaf dancing in an unfelt breeze. If I must choose a mask, then I confess. I know the one I would select is not in that trunk, nor is it on the stage. The gaunt woman smiled. You wish to wear my mask? This is a most excellent decision, dear Arnold. A man of creativity and curiosity. Come and remove it from my face. I shall take your mask and become you. May the spirits we become inhabit us deeply and truly." She finished. When Tarnold did and placed the living Eldlock mask on his face, he saw, finally, the true ending of Sotes's play. It was flawless and terrible, life-giving and breathtaking. Places, my friends and fellows, he said. Our tale waits for no one. Let us fall together to rise as one, and sing our harmonies with the gust of life. One last gust. One last gust, replied Lamp, Wolf and Vulture. And together they played. The scene then cuts to a bit later, when the nobles were gathering before the theater. The entire day, Dorte avoided telling Tarnold that Lady Erhin passed away. It was said her illness carried her off in kindred company before dawn. Dorte didn't want the news to break the morale of the entire theater. It would be especially hard for Tarnold. Still, there was a bright side to this. On her deathbed, Lady Erhin decided to pass a good fortune to Tarnold and the mummers round. As the gate opened, the audience rushed in, but they all stopped short, as they found the actors posed upon the stage, covered in wilted black-stemmed roses. Their buzzing anticipation was hushed by the disturbing sight. They quickly and quietly found their seats. Lady Erhin's seat of honor was the only empty spot in the house. The actors held their strenuous positions while the noble audience waited for Sotes' long, lost and unfinished masterpiece to finally begin. Dorte saw no sign of Tarnold. It was unusual for the dramatist to desert his cast on opening night. Normally he would greet the audience before watching, with a bottle of wine. He turned to inspect the opening stands. Nanny and Emil were locked in mortal embrace. Nanny, wearing the wolf mask, held an arrow that seemed to stick directly into Emil's side. Emil's hands were wrapped around Nanny's throat. Artlow, who was supposed to be playing a philosopher, now inexplicably wore a mask that resembled a dirged crow. He perched atop a prop tree, suspended over the other pair, his arms outstretched like great wings. Dead flowers hung from his arms like feathers. They weren't even breathing. The audience stayed silent, eagerly awaiting action, but Dorte realized something was amiss. Backstage, Dorte checked the dramatist's favorite perch, but there was no bottle of wine, no Tarnold either. Instead, there was the last surviving copy of Lambs in the Orchard. He thumped to the last page. The story remained unfinished, but there was a new line written in Tarnold's steady hand. The end is not for those who wear no masks. She showed me, 
and it was beautiful. Now, I have to confirm, just like everything surrounding Kindred, this story was written to be vague. And so, there is an incredible amount of easter eggs if you dive deep into this. And so, to avoid digging up another rabbit hole, I want to talk about the more obvious ones. But be wary, this will get crazy. First of all, I am pretty sure everyone died at the end. The wolf stabbed the lamb with her own arrow, the lamb strangled the wolf, and the vulture had nothing to feed on after their death. Or at the very least, the actors died, since, as it was mentioned, none of them were breathing. But what they were portraying in that scene is equally as important to mention. You see, since this was the ending of Sotes's play, I think that Sotes wrote a story about the ultimate end, the death of the death. After everyone is gone, no one believes in death anymore, which means that the power of Kindred would fade away. And with no one to hunt, I could see why Kindred would hunt each other. That could also be why the Vulture was suspended over them. The Vulture is responsible for the second death. It devours those who are entirely forgotten. Therefore, they truly die. That's why the Vulture would devour Kindred. With no one to believe in them, they would be forgotten. I wonder if this is relating to the name of the play, Lambs in the Orchard. Since it's naming multiple lambs, maybe this is referring to the harvesting of death, or rather the end of the deathly spirits. Interestingly though, this power dynamic of the gods getting their power from worshippers only works for spirits. The story of Jenna, the spirit of wind, is a great example of this. If no one believes that she even exists, she is weak. But coincidentally, in this story, kindred are called spirits three times. So maybe this entire time, kindred are not gods of death, they are spirits. But since so many people believe in them, they just happen to be the most powerful deathly spirits. Which means that they would be the same kind of entity as all the other cards we saw in Legends of Runeterra. Just, again, Kindred would be more powerful. Next, in this story, the Vulture mentioned how Sotes would soon be forgotten. And that's because Starnold had the only copy of the lamp in the orchard. At the end of the story, Dorte picked it up, but with only one copy left. The chances are Sotes' work was soon forgotten. I believe that's why this story also happened in the past. It's because it is very probable that in the current days, no one even knows who Sotes is. That's why the present stories about Kindred are so mysterious. Another thing is that if you have a look at the art of this story, at the bottom you can see the Mask Mother giving the lamb mask to a woman. This is likely referring to the mother's description. There, it was teased that it is possible that the Mask Mother made the masks for Kindred. And this might be showing that exact moment. Although, this art was made for the theater in Nockmerge. So this is more of a legend or a tale, instead of it representing what actually happened. That's why the Mother's description starts with, they say. It's because this is the story. Another interesting detail is that at the very beginning of the story, Artlo was playing the philosopher who wouldn't stop dying. This character was probably originally written by Sotes, and I wouldn't be surprised if the philosopher was Sotes herself. I wonder if this meant that she couldn't die for some reason. In a way, this could explain why Sotes was even able to write this play. Maybe something like the Blessed Waters kept her alive even after she died. And in this brief window of undeath, she was able to see the ultimate end. But that part is really unclear. Also, in this story, it was very cool to see that the lamp and the wolf became themselves after swapping masks. At the end, Nanny and Emil swapped the masks and that unleashed them. But I don't think that was because the spirits were waiting for the right person to embrace them. I think it's because the lamp and the wolf swapped their masks. I think that's because that's how the spirits are portrayed. The lamp and the wolf are wearing the mask of the other one. And after the actors did that, that's when they were unleashed. Next, the lady mentioned that the broken mask relates to a story of the Mask Mother. And in Legends of Runeterra, we learned that stories tell of the Mask Mother making the masks for the lamp and the wolf. If we connect these together, we learned that the two masks were likely made when another mask broke into two halves. 
And of course, this likely relates to the original Death Spirit, the Grey Man, who split himself in two. Next, we can mention that the Mask of the Mask Mother, which the lady wore, blossoms with its mother tree, even when detached from it. I wonder if this is some kind of subtle link to the origins of death, like how all death spirits still bloom and thrive, as long as the concept of the original death is still alive. Once again, a detail that could spark a cool theory. Also, the story mentioned that every time someone puts on the mask of the Mask Mother, their spirits are connected and they become one. Meaning that because the mask showed Tarnal the end of the play, it means that when Sotes died, she got linked to the Mask of the Mask Mother, and then eventually it got to Tarnold. So maybe the Mask Mother is a massive chain of linked spirits. And again, this could be linked to the mask blooming even when away from its source. Maybe the spirits wearing the Mask of the Mask Mother only gather more spirits, but together they all get linked to one source. And they do this by donning the mask of another death spirit. That's what was shown in the cards, and it was even shown in the story's art. This could also be linked to another detail. The story mentioned that the lady had distant eyes shining through the mist. I think that those eyes shining through mist would be the eyes of the original Mask Mother on the Shadow Isles. Remember, this story happened after the Rune Wars, so the Blessed Isles were already shrouded in mist. So the original Mask Mother being there makes sense. See, this is what I meant when I said that this entire story has insane amount of details and you can just keep digging. It never stops. Which also reminds me that the lady mentioned that no one wants to hear the story about the Mask Mother. That's why someone like Kindred are more powerful than her. It's because the Mask Mother might be getting slowly forgotten. And lastly, two cool details from the past. The story mentioned that Jarvan III enjoyed a story called The King of All Fishes. I wonder if this is linked to the River King, Tam Kench. And lastly, back in the day, the Great City of Demacia was simply called King Jarvan II's Great City. Meaning that back then, maybe outsiders weren't really used to calling that region Demacia. But that's all the cool details found in the story. It really came out of nowhere. And especially since we are about to see Isolde pop up on PBE, some people wonder if the Mask Mother and Lady Erhin could somehow be linked to her. Riot usually releases teaser stories. Especially since Sotes mentions an ever-dying philosopher, with Isolde being in a similar state. Also, the art at the very bottom might be similar to Viego's story. At least they have matching hair color. Personally, since here the lady wore the mask of the Mask Mother, Therefore, we could speculate that this was the Mask Mother. I had the urge to dive into another theory, which mentions how the Mask Mother changes shapes, depending on who's wearing it last. So you know, this could be some kind of Vastaya. But I know the moment I mention it, Riot will release more info that disproves it. But hey, I'm not even sure what I'm talking about. I have never mentioned a death-worshipping Vastaya before.